this is Rick Hansen. I'm a neuropsychologist and the program you're watching is The Loving Brain, Tools for Real Issues. This series is freely offered uh, through a partnership between Entheos and myself and you're very welcome to download it and share it with others if you like. I'm really happy today to have with me uh, our very first guests in this series, uh, Drs. Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt who are legendary, not a term I use lightly, uh, figures in uh, psychology and especially in the field of relationships. Uh, if I could share with you a little bit about their background, first speaking about Harville, uh, he's a clinical pastoral counselor with over 40 years of experience as a therapist, educator, clinical trainer, author, and lecturer. He and his wife, Helen LaKelly Hunt, co-created Imago Relationship Therapy, a therapy for couples now practiced by over 2,000 certified therapists in 30 countries. Harville and Helen have co-authored 10 books on intimate relationships and parenting, including Harville's New York Times best-selling uh, book, The Legendary, also Getting the Love You Want. He's been described as the marriage whisperer by Oprah Winfrey uh, and been featured on, his sh on her show 18 times. Uh, for the past four years, Harville has been working to ignite a global movement to educate people about the value of healthy, intimate relationships. He and Helen reside in New York City and have been married over 30 years. They have six children and grandchildren. So welcome, Harville. Thank you. Glad and to then be as here. for Helen, who I'm also very delighted to have with us, she's been an important partner to her husband, Harville, both in the evolution of Imago theory and the growth of Imago's global organizational infrastructure. Dr. Hunt has also been active within the women's movement, helping to catalyze and grow the area of women's philanthropy. Five years ago, she co-founded Women Moving Millions. I love the title of that. A global movement of donors with the goal of raising the bar in women's giving. Dr. Hunt is an honored inductee in the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca, New York, and she's the author of Faith and Feminism, A Holy Alliance, published by Atria Books, and she's the author of the recent article, Healthy Marriage, Healthy Women and Girls, inviting the women's movement to take up equality in marriage as an agenda. Many people have mentioned that the women's movement has in some ways rolled through the corporate world, to some extent certainly, but not so thoroughly necessarily uh, in family life. Uh, Dr. Hunt's greatest passion is deepening her relationships with her children, uh, pardon me, with her husband and their six children each day. Yeah, yeah, don't leave out Harville. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, don't leave out Harville for sure. Uh, Harville and Helen's newest book, a fantastic book, which I really recommend highly, is called Making Marriage Simple, 10 Truths for Changing the Relationship You Have into the One You Want. And it was published by Crown just recently in March 2013. So Harville and Helen, welcome. We're very glad you're here. Thank you. Very a, glad to be here. A pleasure. Okay, great. So uh, they are coming to us, I believe, from their home, probably in New York City, right? And yes. I'm coming to you all from the converted laundry room, which is now the home office of my own in San Rafael, California. Mm. So. To dive in, um, I'd like to begin with a question that I'll uh, ask most people, if not everyone who's a guest on this show. Relationships, of course, involve both outer actions and our inner experience. In one or more senses, outer actions or inner experiences, why has it been important to you personally to become more skillful regarding your relationships? Regarding our relationship? Yes. No, not necessarily just with each other, but relationships in general. This is a kind of opening it up kind of question. Well, I think it's important, became important for us to deal with relationships because we discovered in our research uh, in developing Imago Relationship Therapy that the powerful impact of the uh, early childhood experiences on individuals selection of a partner and what's important about that the quality of relationship they have with that partner and it, it and so that it turns out that relationship is a very deep and complex thing rather than just a series of transactions mm -hmm. that relationship quality and relationship uh, interaction has to do with meaning deep meanings uh, deep unmet needs needs that are clamoring to be met and that 
what was missing in the equation of um, marriages, especially marriages that were stressed uh, all the way down to marriages that were broken, that led to divorce, was their inability to have interactions with each other that were directed toward uh, resolving those uh, unresolved childhood issues. In other words, they didn't know how to be in a relationship. The relationships were driven from uh, historical um, unmet childhood needs uh, without any skills uh, by which to negotiate those needs. So it appeared to us that what we needed to help couples do way more than understand themselves or way more than understand their past and their childhood or to do historical explorations, although we include that, uh, was to uh, acquire a technology by which they could have what we now call a safe conversation, a dialogical conversation, to create uh, a safe space in the ecosystem of their relationship, a safe space, which where their anxiety would be triggered and where they could really experience who each other was, what each other needed, and then negotiate how those needs would be met. Because it was really clear that if the needs left over from childhood shows up in a marriage are not addressed and met, the marriage will always be difficult. Mm. So that's a great foundation. Thank you. Yeah. Learning basic relational skills, not just like communication skills, but how to how to really talk so that you actually get to know who the other person is that you're with. Begin and move from a transactional relationship to interactions that are truly relational and which include this is who you are uh, and to accept the fact that that you're different we are different my childhood is different your childhood is different my needs are different because difference is the great challenge for all of us to accept yeah. the fact that everything is not like us yeah so that's right that's cool thing. and i will add two things to that the importance of relationship i'd like to start with a quote of dostoevsky's that I read when I was a teenager, mm. which is, the person who desires to see the living God face to face will never find God in the empty firmament of his mind, but in human love. Mm. And relationship is, it's not just about an intimate partnership or relationship skills aren't just about the institution of marriage. It's also about a spiritual process, two people moving to understand something much larger than either one of them. And so that's why the skills are important. People long to be in relationship but don't have the skills. And the second reason, as a woman in the women's movement, we um, echo what I hear Harville saying, we need to move from the vertical to the horizontal in this culture, not top-down decisions, but co-create the future. And Gloria talks about moving from ranking things, who's on top, to linking things. That we're trying to shift a dynamic in the culture that's more horizontal. So people long to work in partnership and co-create, but we don't have the skills. Mm. We know how to do it. Right. And skills do exist, and that's what we'd like to get to be more public. That's great. If you would be willing to talk a little bit, either individually or as a couple, about a relationship you've pers a relationship issue, an issue rather, that you've personally faced, and especially how you dealt with it in, in concrete and practical ways, I bet a lot of people would you know, be very helped by hearing about that. Is that yours? Well, should I do the, which one should I do? Well, I think you should do the most challenging <clears throat> one that led to the real transformation in our marriage. Oh, and... okay. Okay, uh, so Rick told us that question might be coming. So, well, we basically, uh, the one Harville is suggesting we mentioned is that we were talking to divorce lawyers, and that was an issue because we... So the issue was whether we would stay married or not. That's yes. That one. And we were promoting a theory, and we didn't know how to live it. And we resolved that issue with a decision to uh, add something to the theory we hadn't thought of before, which was to eliminate negativity from 
our communication as much as possible. Mm. And uh, that sounds harder than it is to do. <laughs> um, sounds easier. Okay, that sounds do. easier better than it is to, it is to actually do. Yeah. Um, because sometimes you don't know if you're being negative. In my case, I thought I was being helpful. Like, I thought, you know, who else is going to tell Harville he has spinach between his teeth? And I... Um, That's pretty negative. <laughs> I was... Uh, <laughs> I was willing to do that and more and not even charge him a fee for my consultancy. Yeah. That lucky guy. I know. He has, he, and, but that's not how it rang to him. So we so, literally ended up putting a calendar in our, um, on our medicine cabinet. And every day we would put a little smiley face if we succeeded at not being negative. It was something <laughs> like this. That's pretty great. Oh, it's how you say it. That's wonderful. Yeah, we, is that from one of your books, Harville or Helen? And, and not yet. Well, that sounds like a good book. Uh, <laughs> so let's go back to that. So I'm going to kind of bridge that to the work you've done on how early childhood experiences um, yep. impact relationships. So there you both worked on getting the negativity out of your relationship. Um, kind of a two-part question here. Part one Maybe you could use your work on Imago uh, to illustrate, to use this example to illustrate that work. In other words, how did either or both of your childhoods affect the negativity that was coming into your marriage? That was mm -hmm. a major factor in leading you to talk with divorce lawyers. And then second, how did you grapple with that negativity, not just in a kind of top-down behavioral sense, which is better than the alternative, but mm -hmm. to go all the way down, as your work so much does, to the very roots of it? in the younger strata of the psyche and maybe the deeper layers of the brain? The issue from my childhood that showed up with um, us talking to divorce lawyers was it was hard for me to ask clearly for what I wanted. Um, I am very intuitive and I have a sense about how things feel and I could sense something uh, was wrong in our relationship or in our family, and I would tell Harville what the problems were, as if that would help. And that's not, you know, I wasn't, my brain, actually, my, the, the left hemisphere had not formed so that I could be very concrete and specific and ask for what I want. Mm. And so, poor guy, he would come home and I would have my list of 30 issues, which, you know, then he couldn't respond to any of them. So, um, I think in my growing up, I was raised to be a Southern Belle in Dallas, Texas. My father was an oil well driller and started an oil company. So, I was supposed to be a nice, pretty thing and not think because the men were supposed to think and I was supposed to feel. So I was great at feeling, especially feeling um, worried. Yeah. And warriors are really nice people, but they're hard to live with. And um, so I hadn't learned to think clearly, and I learned to think clearly. And so now I can slip in an issue in front of Harville with a potential solution, and he'll go, oh, that makes sense. Mm. That's great. Thank you, Helen. How about you, Harville? Well, I think I was thinking that it's an interesting question about what childhood issue was uh, active in the stresses that led us to consider divorcing. Um, and there, there are actually several, but I think the parallel one to what you're talking about is that I grew up uh, with uh, no permission to feel, and Helen grew up with no permission to think. So without a permission to feel, I had difficulty uh, reading her yes. and being empathic with her, with her feelings, uh, including her, because as a non -feel, as a non feeler but primary left brain thinker, I also felt um, pretty independent and and therefore. Um, tended to make unilateral decisions um, and to sort of ride my own horse yeah. and not be aware that, that I actually 
that somebody else lived in the barn with me, and that uh, that we were that we were partners. Yes. So that uh, exclusion factor and Ellen's sense of who she was, and 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 there was a kind of can I make the comment about the ex, you know, the that one of the childhood things a little uh, bit uh, uh -huh. uh, about <clears throat> the, about her not being included in conversations when she was little. Oh, uh, and I grew up basically as a as sort of a I call it a secondary orphan. I live with my my parents died, so I live with my sisters um, in an orphan status, although it was with, with a family. So there was this huge difference between the way we organized the world. I organized it cognitively, she organized it emotionally. Uh, I excluded, she needed to be included. And so finally that, and, and the way we both dealt with that was with critiques of each other instead of with yes. Even though we had designed a technology by which to transform frustrations into wishes and ask for what you want, uh, neither of us were conscious enough, or at least I wasn't conscious enough at the time, to operationalize our own uh, relational technology. May I make a comment? Sure. Since the title of this is The Loving Brain, we thought we had a marriage problem, but we really had a brain hemisphere problem. <laughs> These two hemispheres hadn't gotten married. That our job was for me to learn to be more linear mm. and succinct in my communication. And Harville needed to move to become more right brain, for right. he was emotional and, and holding. Right. So, so to say it back to you in effect, and again using the conventional idea, Helen's right hemisphere, more emotionally focused and also typically threat focused, you know, that's where the worrying of course comes in, married more of Harville's left hemisphere, verbal, linear, sequential, kind of top down, right? Detached. And, yeah, the ten detached. And we needed it, you needed to become individually integrated so that your marriage could be more integrated. Yeah, once, once we worked at uh, um, lateralizing our brain hemispheres, we, and they were, the, we needed neural surgery, actually, yeah. instead <laughs> of a divorce. And so once we did that, um, the marriage became much more joyful. In fact, that's one of the uh, uh, palliative things that happened was that you, uh, Helen, began to read uh, brain research by mm -hmm. Judith Gordon and the uh, Women's Center uh, at uh, at the Stone anyway, Center at, at Wellesley on separate knowing versus connected knowing. Yeah. That separate knowing is um, the the left brain knowing and connected knowing is the right brain knowing. You swing into the thing to be known, and mm -hmm. I would swing into problems, and Harvard would Harvard would distance from them. So. That was a, a wake-up call for me, a eureka. Like, yeah. oh, oh, we're not morally and ethically depraved that we don't have a good marriage. We just are neural dysfunctional right now. <laughs> and, and, and the brain is plastic. Oh, my goodness. There's something we can do. That's right. There's something you can do if it's plastic. It's changeable. I want to kind of say back to you uh, something I'm hearing you say and then broaden it out. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to what you're saying about these two different, you could say, neurological styles, in part rooted in childhood training, gender socialization, we'll get to that in a minute, um, now coming together. Obviously, of course, you two are a heterosexual couple. Uh, what you're talking about would, in principle, I'm sure, apply to same-sex couples that are romantic yeah. couples, yeah. as well as to many other kinds of significant important relationships such as perhaps sibling relationships some of the longest relationships we have in the lifespan of course are with our siblings uh, as well as best friends or uh, partners in a business uh, even situations where the relationship is an important one a significant one and you're kind of stuck in it but there may be a fair amount of tension so mm -hmm. I wonder if you could take your points uh, about a let's say a heterosexual marriage and if you could or a long-term relationship, if you could broaden them out to non-romantic relationships that are still significant and consequential for people. Want to take a crack at that? 
and the question is how this applies to yeah. non-romantic relationships. Yeah. yeah, both I would say this being this notion of mismatches in mismatches. brain style, as yeah. well as effects <clears throat> vertically of early life experiences on how people are in their non-romantic but still very significant relationships. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can make a comment okay. about that. I can too. And you can so too. You want to go first? I'm happy to. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it applies. The Imago theory for couples applies to all sorts of relationships um, in that uh, people are longing to feel heard in their important relationships. And the main problem that creates stress in a relationship is if a person doesn't feel heard and understood. Yeah. So, Rick, it's really a cultural issue that we are trained by our culture in grade school, junior high, college, that if we speak well, if we write a good paper, we get rewarded. And on the job, if you're a good debater, if you can argue your point well, you rise up the corporate ladder, and that's where you get a promotion. And, mm -hmm. and no one rewards you if you're a good listener. And no one um, <coughs> compliments you if you're, you know, you're considered a whip. And so, so it's a real cultural issue that, that um, a, a, a mago, our theory, teaches the taking terms of speaking and listening. And it has a profound impact on any relationship. So, and what I would uh, comment on is um, a little more diagnostic than, than that on the diagnostic side, is um, in the, in the uh, recent neurosciences, the conversation about memory has to do with implicit and explicit memory. And um, childhood is uh, all a, a uh, what is it, a, when you put things together, uh, a, those things you do for the children when you put all the pictures together, what do you call those? A collage. A collage. Um, childhood is a collage um, of um, implicit feelings, not events. And so, um, and I'm a, I'm a reader of neuroscience, but as I understand neuroscience up until about the age of four, that you do not have event memories. You have affective memories, emotional memories. And so therefore, these memories not attached to events are not attached to time. And therefore, they are available for eternity to be triggered in any context. So when you are in a business and someone... Uh, uh, behaves or says something in such a way that they trigger an implicit memory, you assume that reality is happening in your face right then. Or if you're with a sibling or even in a line at the grocery store, mm -hmm. someone uh, does that smirk that somehow, or uh, I think the most intensive things that uh, that Edtronic has discovered has to do with the, with the affectivity of the face. Somebody just doesn't look at you or, or is, has no emotional expression or eye contact, and you have an implicit memory about that, you're vulnerable to those intense emotions anywhere, at any time, under any circumstance. And so the, the reason marriage is more intense is that all those implicit memories <coughs> that are dis dispersible to other contexts when you're an adult were created primarily in that private relationship between the child and caretakers. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're much more intense because there are, um, you know, just subtle behaviors that can take place uh, with, a, with marriages that might not trigger you very much as in a, in a, in a work context, but would trigger you enormously in the marriage context. Mm -hmm. And um, so consequently, childhood appears, an unresolved childhood issues, Helen and I think, are probably one of the major contributors to violence on the planet. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, everything that happens in the family basically gets extended into the culture. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the reasons that we are in this issue, and, and I want to add to that, Helen and I both are launching this global relationship wellness movement. One reason we're doing that is that most activities that have to do with taking care of human problem have to do with downstream cleanup. That is the consequences of what happened in the family mm -hmm. showing up in marriage, in businesses, in governments, in wherever, mm -hmm. um, and poverty and violence and prisons and all those kinds of things have to, children's performance in schools have to do with the quality of life in the family. So we decided that instead of spending all our time joining all the projects to clean up the river, that we'd go upstream and see if we could figure out who was throwing the kids, who, who were throwing people in the river and see if we could get the river clean at the headwaters. Right. It's to improve the quality of relationship of primary partners, uh, whatever their gender preferences are. That's great. All right. Did you want to... Okay. I just think that's such a cool idea. I mean, Harville came up with this. He said, a healthy relationship is the ultimate upstream prevention. That's right. It's all this downriver cleanup. And I said, hello, you got it. So... That's great. Well, um, one of the things you've talked about, and maybe here I'll swing more toward you, Helen, uh, you've done real work on faith and feminism, faith, um, how that uh, affects people. And when I think about some of the, if you will, upstream influences on people, for better or worth, worse, um, it has to do with the religion in which they were raised, sometimes. And so I wondered if you could talk a bit about how childhood religious influences can shape people in their significant relationships today, not just romantic relationships. And then second, uh, how you as a modern woman, as a feminist, have uh, woven together the strands of faith and feminism in your own life. Sure. Well, I think whether it's childhood religious influences or if someone comes to your front door and you answer it and they wanted to invite you into their faith it's all it's um the faith journey um in all religions is about learning compassion mm. and i i think we see it as 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 we all have these egos which are what about me you know uh um, am I going to make it through life? Am I being com um, protected enough? Am I getting enough? Like our lower brain automatically is asking that question. Our lower brain every second is going, am I safe or am I dangerous in this moment? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the small ego. And an enlarged ego, every, every religion says that the goal is compassion for others like moving beyond thinking about your self-interest to the self-interest of others. So it's, um, to, to do that, it's, it's a restructuring of, the, um, of neural energy, and that's been documented with the Dalai Lama research, the research on meditators of um, the Maharishi and all sorts of... Um, um, theologies have had it documented that meditative practice improves the brain. It's, it's advanced neural science. And something very quiet, when you quiet the brain and think of someone else, um, that, that that's uh, good for the other people, but good for yourself. You're getting um, different, a different release of neurochemicals that make you feel better. When right. you're angry with someone, you end up feeling bad, the cortisol. But right. if you are loving someone else, you give yourself that, that neurochemical bath. Right. So um, the feminist community um, really wanted peace on earth, goodwill, and, uh, you know, and wanted equality and justice, but often did it from a place of anger. I want my rights. And... I believe that developmentally that angry protest was essential for the first message to get out. But that wedding faith with our feminism, which for many cultures is essential, like the Latina culture, 
they, they, their power comes from their faith. So being open in the African American culture, that's that's their that's a power source for them. And wait, reading that faith helps re unleash love as they fight for justice, as women fight for justice, as we fight, and as um, enlightened men support women in fighting for justice. If we do it from a base of love, it's far more powerful than than justice only. Mm. Do you, well, thank you for that. I appreciated that a lot. Um, maybe you could just uh, briefly, Helen, if you don't mind, uh, help people know what you mean by some of these slippery words like faith and spirituality. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, why don't you throw out a, a challenging question? <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> Would you All like right, to get them? Right. <laughs> it's those okay. short words, faith. <laughs> right? What do you mean well, by the I word faith? Well, I, I, I think that um, a faith stance is one that is open to trust in a cosmic design that's on one side as they're grappling with the problem. You're not alone in the world trying to solve the problem, but there are maybe, maybe there's a reason you're dealing with the problem, and that reason will become clear over time. Mm -hmm. So it's a faith, um, a, a faith stance that makes you curious about the problem. And if you're curious about the problem instead of judgmental, uh, that's, there's much more of a chance for a happy outcome. Does that yeah. answer your question, Rick? Yeah, that's great. So let me, let's bring it down to something really practical. What do you do um, in a couple, let's say, uh, let's say it's a romantic relationship where they have very different faiths, including one of them has no faith at all, let's say, potentially. Uh, and let's say that this could be an issue, including, for example, uh, how to raise the children. Do we raise them agnostic, Christian, Jewish, or what? Or some kind of goulash of all the above? What do we do? And so what uh, practical suggestions might you offer, maybe building on your work around conflict, uh, for relationships in where uh, this is a source of tension, this difference, if you will, including in terms of how people were raised, perhaps, that's now showing up in their relationship with each other? Well, we would invite that couple into a dialogue process. And we would invite a couple to take turns sharing why they Yes. In the dialogue process, one person is the sender, and they would say why they feel the way they do about how the children should be raised. And the receiver then mirrors, validates, and empathizes. It's a three-step process. Hmm. When they mirror, it's a left brain. Let me see if I've got the words right. And then when they validate and empathize, it's a right brain. So they get all their brain loving and on board at that moment. Right, getting that this, integration going you were talking about. Right. Okay. When, when the sender sends no reactivity, no judgment, you mirror, validate, and empathize. Then it's switched, and the other person is the sender, and they talk about their position of how to raise the children in a faith tradition or not. And the receiver mirrors and validates and empathize. And you, you just go back and forth and gently hold each other, be loving to each other, loving to each other's brains, and eventually a co-creation emerges. Whoa. I don't know if I have faith in that. Uh, yeah. Uh, you what don't I mean have by that, and I'm a long-time couples counselor, okay? And as I told you, I've been married 31 years plus, so... What do you do in situations, I mean, all that sounds very wonderful when it happens, you know, if it's that easy, they probably don't need to read a book in the first place. But what do you do in situations where one person just isn't very willing to be empathic or just not good at it? Uh, and Or alternately, what do you do if they both have all the empathy for each other in the world and they just have a strong disagreement? 
Right. That's where the only thing that will help is zero negativity. Well, okay, even though there, so I'm pushing a little. Let's okay. say, to use an example, uh, we have a family where one person is a dedicated athe uh, atheist who believes that raising children in a spiritual way is a bad way to raise them. It's mere superstition. Let's suppose, on the other hand, the other person is uh, a person of faith for whom it's very, very meaningful, whether in a formal Jewish, Muslim, Christian, or what have you sense, Burmese, Hindu well, sense, whatever, or a more general sense. So they disagree. <coughs> what would you advise them then? Um, I'm going to uh, turn to Harville, but really the first thing is for the couple to become safe with each other when they talk about it. Because when there's anxiety in the relationship, the neural energy gets blocked in the lower brain. If there can be safety, they can go into the higher brain, the problem-solving part. And for example, they might agree that out of 12 months of a year, six months they're going to raise their ch children in the tradition, and the other six months hands off, and or uh, switch every other month, or you'll work out something that it's a both and. Mm -hmm. But they can't even go to that creative part of the brain if they're uh, feeling at loggerheads. Mm -hmm. So Harville and I uh, do things like get Groucho Marx glasses and like little, uh, you know, funny nose with the mustache. And sometimes like we'll have talks, um, you know, I, you know, whatever will make it safe for our partner to relax a little um, knowing that the solution isn't, we know what's not going to work, and that's yes. both people to dig in their heels. Yeah. Okay, well, thank I, you. Harville. Well, to stay with the dialogue piece, um, I've been doing that process for about 30 years, and all couples are in an, a position of opposition uh, about something when they come in the room. And sometimes it's about uh, where we're going on vacation, and sometimes it's about primary values, mm -hmm. and all of which are instances of difference, yes. and diff is nature showing up. There's no such thing as sameness. It's all difference. And what, um, as a clinician, I've found is that it isn't enough just to have a conversation about it, that you have to sit in the tension of the opposites long enough to be safe enough is helped to use the word safety. That that word is not not negotiable. That and if, if people are very defensive, they are very anxious. Yes. Uh, about being controlled, about being eclipsed, about something bad happening. There's a anxiety taking some some form that's justifiable. Like Islam is better than Christianity, but that's just anxiety. Mm -hmm. And if what I've seen over and over, if couples will sit with the tension long enough to feel really seen by the other one and not judged, I finally get it. I can see what's going on. That really makes sense. And now I know why you've been arguing for the mosque instead of the Catholic Church. That really makes sense. Um, <clears throat> that if, when that becomes mutual, and you have to sit with it until it's mutual, um, then both people have, have sort of taken their feet off of their, their bank, you know, their, and, uh, and they, then they move into a co-creation of an outcome that neither one could have thought of by themselves, nor that would have worked. They would never have come up with it. But it's the creative process, the integrating process in the brain that occurs with holding the tension of the opposites mm -hmm. until there is a release of, you know, in the spiritual traditions of to the ego. So there's release of that. Yes. And so to me, that's just good couples therapy. That that it, that, that happens uh, with Helen and me around, because we have really different spiritualities. And so how do we live together? We have differences about vacations. So how do we go on? How do we have vacations? Yeah. It's the, it's the, the fact of difference. So... If you ask the question of me as a therapist, I would say that, that I fundamentally will be patient and sit with you until um, anxiety uh, reaches uh, sort of a zero point. 
so that I can actually see another world, see into another mind, and not judge the mind I see into. Because if I judge it, I'm still, uh, I'm still in a vertical position. I'm the one who has right, I'm, and you have to move to this horizontality. Aside from that, somebody just has to make a decision and say, well, I'm going to send them to the mosque. I'm too bad about that. And then take the consequences. But of course, that's not a solution. Uh, that's, you know, that's just a kind of stopgap measure. That's great. But you okay. have to sit until visibility, sit until listening becomes sacred, listening becomes spiritual, mm. knowing that, uh, Helen and I call it the principle of otherness. Mm. Most people don't really get this thing about otherness because otherness really sucks. <laughs> you know, just Jean Paul Sartre said, Hell is other is people. Other people. <laughs> yes, he did. And he was very clear about it. And I understand that very much so it's, as, a, as, a, as a human being and as a therapist. Absolutely. Hell is other people. And you won't see it my way. And there's only one way, my way. Mm -hmm. And we all know that's pure anxiety rooted also sometimes in developmental uh, immaturities that you have to sit with until the anxiety goes down. Um, and so Helen got back to got to zero negativity. What what we discovered, and this is kind of picking up on. So if we're all got uh, contaminants from childhood, across the spectrum of our human experience, from marriage to work and um, and school and wherever else we are, what is the common factor that we have to that we see present everywhere? And what's the common toxin that has to be taken out of human interaction? And we're, uh, we're pretty good at getting down to the basics and to the simplification of the complexities. Like connection is reality. So if, and connection as reality is joy. If you're not feeling joy, you're anxious. Mm -hmm. And if you're anxious, somebody has put negativity into your ecosystem. Mm -hmm come from you, could come from somebody else. But the negativity, which is the sense that you are not okay as you are, so you have to be somebody else or do something else. That negativity is the one thing that must be extracted from all human ecosystems. Harva, let me interrupt you though a little bit and this kind of builds on something Helen said earlier. Yep. Um, negativity is an important word, so maybe you could say what you mean. And some of the context of that is historically people in groups who have been put down or yep. discriminated against, uh, who are rightfully outraged uh, at how yes. they've been treated, um, are told, oh, don't be so negative. Yep. Or, well, if you weren't so angry, we'd be willing yep. to give you more crumbs from our table, et cetera, yep. et cetera. So how can a person not, as it were, throw the passionate, justice-oriented baby out with the negativistic, problematic bathwater? No, I've got an answer yeah. to that. Well, yeah, I mean, see, the that. power of Martin Luther King and the power of Gandhi is they marched for peace. They marched for equality. And they didn't, they marched in love. Mm. Their movement was love-based. Yeah. And yeah, anger, anger fueled the love, but you can definitely march for something and make change happen. Say, when you preach the vision, like yeah. hold out the vision, and mm -hmm. um, it's more dynamic. And I think, I think people will, I think people get farther. I mean, that's why, um, I mean, Nelson Mandela is world renown because he didn't turn around and just criticize the mm -hmm. South Africans. He, he said these, you know, he, he was a living sacrifice, if you will, and um, beloved all of the world. Uh, so I want to, but bringing it down to a couple where it's not about Mandela or Dr. Martin Luther King, it's a real situation where one person, let's say in the couple, feels let's say, legitimately fed up at being put down or mistreated or pathologized in some way. Uh, and then when that person tries to assert herself or assert himself in ways that are not perfect but are normal range, 
the other person then says, or even in-laws or others in their cultural group say, oh, no, 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 uh, you should be submissive or you should be quieter or you're not entitled to how you feel or uh, the fact that you said that with an irritated voice means yeah. that you're now, you don't count anymore. It's, uh, you've, lost your, you've lost your vote as it were. I mean, mm. in real couples, in real relationships, oh. uh, down to earth, what would you say in situations like that? How can a person find that sort of sweet spot where they're both uh, being, they're, they're strong, they're grave, they're serious, they mean business, but they don't tip into pitfalls of various kinds? Uh, because I'd like to <clears throat> just make a kind of basic statement um, that we have to get really clear about what negativity is, which is what that person is experiencing. You're not okay if you are not the way we see you. Therefore, don't stand up for yourself. Uh, so negativity in our minds is, is a put down. It's when you make anybody less than they are. Mm. Or, more colloquially, any make somebody less than you are. You know, like any time I say to Helen um, something like, um, well, even as simple as, did you lock the door? Uh, you know, I'm putting her down. I'm making her... Uh, lower in your than tone of voice, not the tone question voice. itself. Yeah, tone of voice itself is a put, just a growl is a put down, and and I think we would take the position that negativity in any form is a dysfunctional behavior, and distinguish that from someone experiencing negativity, which is the, are the examples <clears throat> you're giving, saying that here's my reality. Here's what I feel and think. Here's what I expect from my context. Uh, here's what I'm going to do when my context puts me down. Um, and it's not that I'm going to counter put you down, because that then will just create the, the revolving cycle of conflict. But assertions, uh, healthy behaviors, taking a stand, uh, fighting for justice, is not negative. Fighting for justice is against negativity. So, so we, we categorize negativity as any devaluation of another in any form. So why don't I mention three points and then okay. you finish up? Because this is so important. Yes. Three things. We talk about sender responsibility. That if a person is feeling like it is time to assert myself, we encourage that person to do it in a way that it increases the chance that their partner is going to respond favorably. And get the book, read the book. It's in there. there. There's a way you can do it that encourages a positive response. Number two, I think of marriage like a, it's a skill set. A, a thriving, <clears throat> prosperous marriage is something that's learned. You make it happen. It's not innate. And it's like a Rubik's Cube. You just have to like, yeah, what am I going to do to get him to respond? And sometimes, you know, you figure it out. It's an intelligence test. Um, and what won't work is what most couples, I mean, usually if couples come to therapy, what they're doing at home isn't working. They need to learn something new. Right. So be open to learning something new. And then the last thing I would say is that remember that your partner is longing to be a hero or a shero in your life. Mm. They want to come through for you. They would love to. If anyone out there is like me, what I was great at was convincing Harville he was a buck up. He had screwed up our marriage. He had blown it so many times. I was a saint for being married to him. I mean, I would just sort of document, he's done this wrong, he's done that wrong. And that's... I read the whole report online, Helen. I read the footnotes <laughs> as well. I was impressed. Well, and, you know, what is that... You should it, see the documents. Then he, then he gets so defeated that who's going to... Like, he's not right. going to be motivated. So... Um, I could either approach him from that, see what a jerk you've been, mm -hmm. look at, there have been 10 things this week you've done wrong, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. and I've told you, you know, that's, that's going to uh, demotivate him 
to respond. And there's another approach that works much better. Yeah, I, just as an example, and not from us, but from a client, uh, one time who were working on, they had chronic toxic negativity. Um, and and um, the, the, the wife had begun to arise out of it um, and was able to um, make clear eye-centered statements without putting her husband down. And it wasn't working. He was still counter putting her down. So she said one day to him, I have 30 more days of endurance for your put downs. And then if in 30 days from now, I can not walk into a room with you and feel loved, embraced and safe, I will leave the room forever. And there's no negotiation of that. Well, none of that was negative. Right. That was the statement of reality. That was assertive. Assertive. She, she wasn't did. putting him down, but she was standing her ground and being grave and dignified about it. She didn't say, you're a bad guy, so I'm a good person, I'm going to leave. She said, I have 30, we've talked about this, I have 34 days of my ability to see the downs. <clears throat> so, amazing, did he do? But he was just, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, did and what it did was on the 29th day, on the 29th day, uh, he came and in contriteness knelt in front and said, I see your point. I get it. Wow. And so they went, you know, called the zero negativity pledge. <laughs> um, and uh, their marriage is wonderful. They were both 40 pounds overweight. They lost, began to lose weight. Uh, and everything in their life began to change. So we see That's this great. as this is the toxin that must be removed from marriages and from all of life because negativity right. is anything from the put down to war. Right. You're not trying to muzzle people. You're not trying to get people to paper over their real issues. No, we're You're just really focused on how, as you put it, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's how you say it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's, I think that would be our response. And thank you for pushing on that, because it, it could look simple and easy and saccharine, uh, but it's not at all. It's really intense. And when you push it, as you did, it helps to, uh, I think, to engage that question in a much more serious way. Yeah, you so did a you good job of answering. Amazing. I did? Yes, you did. Thank you. Yeah, you also created a new word on this what, show. Did what you? was that? I think you said horizontalizing. Horizontalizing. Yeah, yes. you made it a verb. Yeah. That's, I never heard that. Yeah. Well, I don't like people who are not creative in the creation of words. So, yeah. I mean, all words were created. What's it called? A nihilism? The ne neologism. Okay. That's it. So, wow. So yeah. this is a historical <laughs> moment, a oh new word. Oh, my gosh. You, could, you, you saw it here. Okay, so we have about five roughly minutes left. Uh, I wonder if I could uh, take this one level even more personal. Um, you know, succinctly, if you could, each of you, what's your growing edge these days in your relationship with each other or, if you prefer, some other deep relationship you're, you're involved in? What's your growing edge? In other words... How are you growing, or what are you trying to help yourself learn, or deepen in, or develop, or become more of, or less of? What are you working on these days? Mm. Go first. Well, unbelievably, unbelievably, we have, I have the marriage of my dreams. I cannot believe I'm so madly in love with this guy when I felt so differently 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the growth edge has come out of really understanding uh, as we've been studying that the idea of the individual is a myth mm. and that we are all relational beings mm. and that um, and we both are, are so fascinated with this paradigmatic shift going on in the culture mm. away from individual um, assertion to relational energy and um, so I think the commitment to make the space 
between Harville and me sacred space, mm. that this is holy ground. And things I thought I could say or ways I would look that feel bad to him, I need to learn what that is. Um, I get frustrated with other people. And this morning, Harville said, Helen, I've got limited tolerance at listening to frustrations about other people. And I said, got it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm just not going to go there. He doesn't need to hear it. And I could say in five sentences, but it would take me to talk five hours about. And he's getting the five sentences these days, would you say? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. great. Well, thank you, Helen. So that's a, and that's also a good example of Harville walking his talk, you know, being assertive without being negative. So how about you, Harville? You're a legendary relationship guy. What are you still working on? Well, I think I'm working on, <laughs> as a legendary relationship guy, working on something very basic. Uh, and that is to continue, that I'm continuing to integrate uh, that Helen is not me, uh, and to uh, regulate uh, those moments of reactivity when she's being her dynamic vital, uh, and she's an intuitive person, her intuitive self, her brain works. You know, she sees the whole picture and I see this little point. Yeah. Of just allowing that to be uh, every time I see it with some sense of... Um, of, um, I think I've gotten through acknowledgement and acceptance, and, but really to... What about appreciate. despair? You know, and, and oh. bargaining, Kubler-Ross' stages, so you haven't really gotten through despair yet about Helen being this way. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I... <laughs> I think that may be it, of getting through despair. But I, but I get what you mean, because it's letting go. Yeah. Letting go. And, and for me, it was hard because my basic injury was in the early months of my childhood. So it's, it's really young. So I think that, that um, holding her in her uh, infinite variety, because she is a very, a person with a, a, a variety of traits. What? Yeah, you. <laughs> and holding that and seeing that that's Helen, being Helen. Again, and isn't that wonderful? Instead of, oh no, that's Helen doing that again. Yeah. Uh, that shift to away from rejection to acceptance, and not only just acceptance, like oh, that's Helen doing that. To wow, that's yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's her doing that. Um, I think that's, um, and and I think the other piece is that we've talked about recently, is um, experiencing. Uh, with me being an isolator, me being uh, uh, experiencing us as becoming real partners, that we are that we really are joined at the hip. We're separate, but we're joined at the hip. And to experience that that hanging out quality of being with, rather than sort of being uh, sort of face to face of being alongside. Right. Instead of thinking about looking together in the same direction. That's great. It's interesting, Harville, the way you put that. Um, you're talking about both differentiating, in other words, recognizing that Helen is not you, and yes. that she's different from you in important ways, and things that right. might be self-evident to you are not at all self-evident to her, and vice versa. Oh, yes, that, that's I yes. Yeah, and also as differentiated beings, joining and as Helen Thanks. said in the very beginning, linking. In other words, connecting Thinking. with each other. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm reminded of the old line, you know, fences make for good neighbors. That differentiation is the foundation of integration. It's absolutely the foundation. And the word we use is differentiation and connection. Okay, connection, yeah. And well, last question, if I could. Uh, yeah. Really succinctly, it's a big question with hopefully a short answer. Ah. If you had a magic wand, each of you, and could wave your magic wand and somehow get a critical mass of people worldwide, 10 million, 100 million, a billion, 7 billion people worldwide, to basically do one thing every day in regard to their relationships, that one thing, what would be your one thing 
that wow. if you could wave a magic wand, um, you would invite the world into? Okay. I have an answer. Okay. Um, to start the day expressing five appreciations of your partner mm -hmm. and end the day with five more, mm -hmm. okay. which means you pay attention throughout the day to come up with five, um, but note what they've done as opposed to keeping track of what they didn't do. So I Thank would you. say identify, regulate, and eliminate negativity. That was succinct. That's great. Identify, regulate, and eliminate negativity. I get That's, it. I'm feeling negative. I, I added identified. I'm yeah. regulating it, and I'm eliminating it. That's so right. that I can, because everything good comes after negativity. That opens a space for joy, connection, love, beauty. But when you're into negation, then you're into only you, and nothing else can exist. That's so right. I want people to let all that go so they can experience uh, reality. Yeah. Okay outside themselves. And that combined with what Helen said about five appreciations in the beginning yes. of the day and five more at the end really comes together because if you think comes of together. it, uh, flowers crowd out weeds. I mean negativity yes. is the weeds, you pull the weeds, you also have to bring the flowers in and bring flowers flower. prevent the negativity, the weeds from growing back again. Yeah. And that's great. Well, we're moving to a wrap here. I have to say that you two are Tied for first place is the most endearing couple I've ever encountered in my entire life. Oh my goodness. So, uh, and it's been a real pleasure to be with both of you. I mean, your work is uh, legendary for a reason. The Imago uh, relationship work, your most recent book, Making Marriage Simple. Uh, it's just been a delight for me to be with you personally, as well as in terms of the, the function I'm serving here. And I want to really thank you for your time. You're so welcome. You're wonderful also. In fact, you are amazing. <laughs> okay, I'll take it in. I'll take it in. All right, well, thank you very much. Harville Hendricks, Helen Hunt Hendricks, thank you very much. Bye-bye. A pleasure. Bye -bye.